Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. We're talking today about the an update on the decline of U.S. relations with China. Carl Baker, who has been around Pacific Forum and other global organizations for years and years, and uh, is a fantastic think tank kind of observer on all of this. Carl, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Jay. So, uh, you know, we, we met in June, seems like a long time ago, and we talked about the obvious deterioration of US-China relations uh, with Trump and Xi Jinping, and now uh, it's a couple of months later, and that deterioration has not stopped. What, what benchmarks do you see, you know, to um, kind of examine the, you know, the direction of that, of that decline? Well, I mean, the three big, of course, the three big speeches, you know, that uh, we had by, uh, by Secretary of State Pompeo and uh, National Security Advisor O'Brien and then uh, FBI Chief Christopher Wray have all painted a very bleak picture about national security concerns from China. And so I think that that's the benchmark is that it's becoming very much a, a, a consensus that there is a problem with national security, that, that our national security is being challenged by China. But what's bothersome for me is that it's hard for me to see where the national security concerns are coming from. Because for example, today, we just had a, a proclamation by Donald Trump that as of September 20, we are no longer allowed to do any business with TikTok and WeChat from, from China. And he's citing national security concerns, but the security concerns are about personal information that might be aggregated by the Chinese that they could use against American citizens. But if you're not traveling to China, I, I fail to see how that's really a, a imminent national security concern to the level that we've heard from, from these, these three individuals. Well, let me, let me throw a theory at you and see what you think. You know, this all started at the beginning of his term where he, he started bashing China um, and he started a trade war with China, which uh, you know, is pretty destructive uh, and threatening. And it didn't achieve anything, even this phase one um, agreement, if you can call that an agreement, um, and, and, and there's no hope of a phase two now, it looks like to me. Um, those, those were not particularly constructive things. And, you, you know, between the race, the race aspect of it and the trade aspect of it and the name calling aspect, um, this all seemed like a way to play to his base and, and bash the Chinese, find a scapegoat, if you will, a shiny object to hand them uh, rather than advance American foreign policy. What do you think about that theory? Well, I think that that, that is certainly a, a component of it, but it's, it's broader than that, I think, Jay. I think, I think that it, it really is a societal problem right now. And, and I think the Americans feel threatened by Chinese technology. They feel threatened by the expansion of, of Chinese military capability. And the one area that, uh, some Americans at least feel threatened by is the movement by the Chinese to assume leadership of international organizations. Now, of course, this is, this is a particular problem with the Trump administration because in some ways we are busy abdicating our role in those international organizations. So I think those are, if you wanna talk about three areas where I see some level of consensus in the United States beyond just what the Trump administration has done in terms of, of, of the economy and in terms of, of, uh, of, of responses to the military uh, activity in South China Sea. I think that, that those are the three areas that I see. And, and again, there's, there's some level of consensus with, with both Democrat and Republican uh, constituencies in Washington that, that this is becoming a problem and that the United States needs to act in response to what they see are Chinese provocation. But is there, is there really a security threat? I mean, for example, yesterday, Senator Blumenthal got up and said that they had been, <clears throat> his committee, Armed Forces Committee, had been taken to a dark room in the, in the basement of the Capitol building and, and sworn um, not to reveal any of the proceedings. And then they were told uh, by the intelligence agencies that uh, Russia was um, undermining our election at a rate more, much more profound than in 2016. Um, you know, using all their old weapons for the Internet Research Agency and the like, and even hacking into our uh, election devices. 
And, and now to me, that is clearly, um, you know, it clearly goes to the security of the United States. It goes mm -hmm. to our elections, our, the fundamental governmental structure that we rely on for the country. Um, and uh, Trump hasn't done anything about that. He ignores it. And, and in fact, he classified this so they had to be sworn to secrecy. But now they're really hampered because they can't do anything about it. Uh, where, according to Blumenthal, it was a fantastic ex existential threat. Now that, to me, is a paramount security concern, much more, much, much greater concern than TikTok. Um, you know, how how does our government establish this kind of policy? Isn't it wrong way Corrigan here? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's that's what I was trying to say early, and I think you see the same thing that that. Okay, if there is a national security concern, what is the national security concern? You can't just throw those words around and not have some some conceptualization of how our our society is being threatened. And I think you're right. Cybersecurity is a problem, and and what Russia is doing with with the elections does create a national security concern. And and what Russia has been doing in in Europe, I think, is a, is a national security concern. And and the arms control. Uh, breakdown between the United States and Russia, that is a national security concern. But what China is doing, I think, is, is really trying to establish itself in, in Asia, which is understandable why they feel threatened by the United States in, in the South China Sea. Now, have they, have they done excessive land claims? Yes, certainly. Have they done, have they done things that, that need to be dealt with? Yes. But the United States has to have some level of cooperation from other people in the region if they're going to be successful in, in contesting what China is doing in, in, those, in those areas. Just like with the economy, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna sanction and you're going to put tariffs on China, you have to have support from the rest of the world. And, and, and Europe isn't, isn't working with the United States and the United States isn't working with Europe on, on developing a collaborative approach. Just like in Southeast Asia, the Southeast Asian countries are not encouraging the United States to take belligerent action. In fact, several of the Southeast Asian countries are saying, hey, United States, please understand that we have our own problems with, with China and we'll deal with them in our own way. But don't, don't think that we're on board with you trying to be overly aggressive in the South China Sea and that we're going to come along with you because we're not. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you and I have shared the uh, Jerome Cohn, the latest blog, uh, in which he includes a number of uh, commentaries by various people, uh, a number of them Chinese in the United States and elsewhere. Um, about you know their reaction to what is going on between the U.S. and China, and one one that sticks with me is uh, is is the uh, is the blog that said um, that the Southeast Asia and all that they're they're standing by, they're waiting in the wings. They don't want to offend the United States, and and they have too much at stake to offend China. So they're they're kind of um, um, just watching, waiting, waiting for, waiting for some resolution of it, and hoping that China and the U.S. can work things out. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it, it sounds like what's happening is this is becoming a mano y mano bilateral um, issue between the two countries, and everybody else is standing to see, to see what happens. Yeah, and and I think that's why perceptions matter. And, and so if, if we're in a competition between, with China for, for uh, international leadership, well, the worst thing we can do is to continue to walk away from international organizations. And that's really what we're doing. So, you know, so, so if, our, if our interests are, are human rights and we're not going to pursue human rights through international organizations, then what are we what are we doing? I mean, you know, China has has developed its own approach to international organizations and it it supports governments. It doesn't it doesn't try to change governments. It's not in the business of creating an empire. You know, and in, in the the, the uh, Cohen piece that you're talking about, several people acknowledge that that China is, is a lot of things. But what it's not is a, a country that's trying to dominate the world. China is perfectly willing to work with other countries and let dictators be dictators, and and it's not it's not out there to dom to to dominate the world. It's there to ensure that its interests are protected 
and protect the interests of other states and support those those people that uh, are are friendly to China. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and one great ironic thing is that uh, China is on the human rights uh, organization within the United right. Nations. Um, and, and so they're, they're heroes for human rights there. <laughs> and realize at the same time, they're doing terrible things on human rights. And, yeah. and frankly, I think the US under Trump is declining on human rights. I mean, it's, there's a recently a book about the caste system. And that's an expansion of the term as it used to exist, as it does exist in India, uh, yeah. where the U.S. has, has, has uh, institutionalized a caste system on race. So we don't look so good either. And meanwhile, at the U.N., they, they're kind of taking a, a leadership role on the issue. That is so ironic. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 we're, and we're sort of, as I said previously, and we're sort of abdicating, right? The United States is sort of abdicating that role to China. So where are we in, in health? Where are we in, in, in World Trade Organization? Where are we in, in the UN? What are we doing? We're, we're sort of saying, well, you know, we don't want to be a part of that. We're going to walk away from these treaties. We aren't going to be a part of the Paris Accord. We are, we're going to withdraw from WHO in the middle of a pandemic. And, and China saying, OK, thank you. You know, there have been several, several uh, commentaries by people who have said, China couldn't ask for more than a second term from Trump because it, it, it's sort of a, a free grab of world leadership that, that uh, the United States is basically giving away. And so, yes, you're right. It is, it is a competition between the US and China and the rest of the world is watching and the rest of the world is watching the United States basically allow China to, to take control of these organizations and, and control their, uh, could control the, the way they're run. Yes, it's very chilling when you say that China would like to see Trump reelected. So let's see, that means China would like to see Trump reelected and so would Russia. And both of those countries have the ability to uh, interfere with our national yeah. elections, uh, which is also chilling. But it doesn't seem to me that China is actively doing that. Is there any evidence that China is, you know, you know sort of rolling out um, some kind of initiative to interfere with our elections? Uh, no, I don't think it is. I don't think I don't think we have seen that. I don't I don't think we've seen the the active role that, that the Russians have played. And again, see, I think I think that that's really inconsistent with what China has done in the rest of the world. They aren't they aren't really interested in trying to to influence um, American society as much as they are interested in in having countries that support China's interests. And, and so I, I don't see them as, as trying, to, trying to undermine the society. Certainly, there's, they're trying to get trade secrets. They're certainly in the business of, of, of stealing technology. And they're certainly in the business of, of trying to, to get people in the United States to support China's interests. But I don't see them, again, I don't see them as trying to create the empire. And that's, and that's really what what it would suggest if they're trying to undermine the society that they want to dominate that they want to dominate the world whatever that really means today yeah. they're happy enough to see the, the way it's going um, you know we, we talked about um, the, the state department and under trump you know the, it's like there is no state department there's no policy there's no plan that was that was clear in um, you know the, these various commentaries there seems to be no foreign policy plan um, but if there was a plan, Carl, uh, and, and Jerry Cohn talked about this, um, and there could be a plan, it could be a plan. With a real State Department, we would have a plan and, and we would deal in a much, much more uh, uh, strategic way with all this. But what would that plan look like in your thought? Well, see, I think actually we, we have a, a bipartisan agreement on development and, and it's, it's trying to work with private inter enterprises to support developmental goals. And so they call the BUILD Act. And, and this, this BUILD Act is really the, forum, the, the format for a true global economic policy. You know, it's, it's easy to say we, we walked away from, from the, uh, from the uh, trade agreements, but really a broader, this, this BUILD Act is really, really represents a much broader approach to economic integration with the rest of the world. And so, while while we we we, are, we don't have the, the 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 just the trade piece, but you also have trade and and development and and uh, uh, 
foreign foreign assistance all working together. And so and so when you have somebody building infrastructure like China and Japan have done, you have the ability to actually create enterprises to use that infrastructure. And and the Build Act really is a policy that that is the for, format for that. But of course, we haven't followed through with it. We haven't done anything with it because that we've we've been distracted with other things. But that really is the basis, I think, for a strong foreign policy. It's not, it's not driven by the military. It's driven by economic concerns and economic cooperation that, that gives the United States some leverage over these countries that uh, China is trying to develop this infrastructure in. Because mm -hmm. what these countries really need is, is, is the capacity to actually use that infrastructure once it's put into place. And, and no one has really thought about how you do that. And, and with all the private capital available in the US markets, of course, it, it's a great opportunity to really develop a, a true economic approach to foreign policy and move it away from the military. Mm. Sounds like a, a, a kinder, gentler, uh, one belt, one road approach uh, where we could uh, you know, meet them on a competitive basis. Where we, we're competing with them, but we're also taking advantage of what they're doing. Instead of seeing it as competition for us, we should be seeing it as an opportunity for us to actually leverage what they've done to our benefit. Yeah, and like and I said, just... like I said, there's there's really the pieces are in place, you know. And and to to his credit, uh, uh, um, on, uh, Assistant Secretary of State uh, Stilwell has actually talked a little bit about that in in some forums that he has he has talked about how that that development program would actually help. But of course, you know, it, it's, it's talk, it's not, it's, there's no money being put, not enough money being, being put against it or any, any real serious manpower being put against it. Mm. Yeah. And query whether we can be confident that anything will happen. Um, but, but looking at the day-to-day uh, -day and the shiny objects and the, and the news uh, uh, and all the media, all the media I look at anyway, um, you know, you have um, the closing down of the, uh, the consulate um, in, um, in, in, in Houston, is it? And now and, and in, 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 uh, in response, the closing down of the American consulate in, in Chengdu. This, these are not happy things. Um, and they are uh, sort of slaps in the face, if you will. And they, they raise the temperature. And it's not just between governments, um, you know, or between Xi Jinping and Trump uh, playing uh, playing, playing, playing with each other, um, it, it, it has an effect beyond that, doesn't it? it? Has an effect to the man in the street who thinks, uh, as I would, that um, these countries are in contention, and the next step could be much more, much more, much more controversial. Yeah, and that's why the rest of the world, as you say, it is watching, and they're they're seeing this, and and nobody really wants to get in between it because they they see that this as a as a sort of a, a, a fight to the end between the two superpowers or between the two the two large powers, you know. But I think one thing we have to understand is that China is a big place, and and you can't you can't really compete with China if you're going to try to to make America first. Because if you try to if you try to focus on the, on the mercantilist approach that China has done you're going to lose because it's not a fair fight. They've got, they've got a few more people and they have an economy now that can actually sustain itself. So, so you, you have to think about how do you really compete on the global level is through, is through cooperation, through collaboration with, with these other countries on, on key issues like climate change, like arms control, like health, uh, like development assistance, all those things. There has to be a collaborative effort. And if you're going to try to compete between the United States, which has a large economy, has a big military, but what it doesn't have is it doesn't have a strong economic policy for global integration. And that's what's missing, I think. And so, and so if you're going to do that, you really have to think about how you collaborate with the other countries. And, and of course, the military and, and other things go with that. Once you start doing that, it's a much, much more effective approach rather than trying to sanction everybody and, and think that because you have the largest, largest economy in terms of GDP, that you can get away with that. And the fact is, is that it, it just isn't sustainable. Well, uh, does this confrontational behavior we see 
usually it starts with uh, with Trump, as it did in the closing of the uh, consulates. Does it concern you? I mean, we have three, four months left. Even if he loses, we have three, four months left. And uh, gee whiz, he could do a lot of things like that to raise the temperature. Does this concern you in terms of you know raising the level of confrontation, maybe even to violence, violence in the South China Sea, violence in in some theater in the world? Well, I think I think that, you know that China has certainly taken the approach to say Trump is crazy. I mean, he's they're they're basically you know characterizing the Trump administration as 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 people who are are irresponsible, and I so I think that that's in some ways a, a good indication that they recognize that that the Trump administration is 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 that they might be able to wait out the Trump administration. And so, and I think that's what the way the rest of the world sees it is that, you know, certainly it puts a lot of pressure on the election in November. But I think that that most of the most of the world sees that if 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 we can get past November, then then we can relook at things. And and even China has has sort of characterized this as, as pre-election uh, posturing by the administration, even giving the administration if. If for some reason the Trump administration the Trump administration wins the election, you know that that they're they're leaving the door open to rethink how we do things after after the November election. So I think that's a bit encouraging uh, that that, the, that at least the Chinese recognize that that this is largely posturing by mm. by an American political party. Uh, to, but, to throw to throw COVID into the soup here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, although uh, Trump has uh, criticized him and used uh, comments like the, the Chinese flu and all this, um, fact is uh, that, that uh, the researchers in China, in Wuhan, gave to the world um, the genome for the virus very quickly. And, uh, you know, I don't think people realize that all these researchers working on vaccine and, or therapeutics, they have the genome for the, for the uh, virus, and that's their way ahead for that. That saved them a lot of time. Um, furthermore, uh, let me add that I understand that China, even uh, now through, through those same laboratories in Wuhan and elsewhere in that part of China are developing, in fact, have developed a vaccine because uh, it's, it's like every country for itself these days. And the level of cooperation developing a vaccine is not what it should be. Um, and China has done that itself. And China is not, not, not burdened by the uh, FDA and, and the, and the uh, phase three trial obligations to be sure of efficacy and safety. So they're actually distributing a vaccine now. Uh, maybe it's kind of a phase three trial without calling it a trial. Um, and if they succeed, Carl, if they succeed in a, in a vaccine that actually cuts down the, the demograph, uh, the you know, uh, uh, the demography on, 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 on further cases, with further in infection of, of uh, coronavirus, they're gonna look like a hero for the world, for the world everywhere. People are gonna see them as advanced on, on the biochemical and um, you know, mm -hmm. medical research end of things. Does that enter into any of this in terms of the relationship? Well, I think it does, but I, I wanna just give a little bit of a corrective there, is that while China is developing its own vaccine, it's also in, in collaboration with with the German company developing a vaccine. And so there was there's news this week that in fact that, that they are entering phase three trials, that that it's a German company and and I, I can't remember the name of the company right now, but it's it's a German Chinese collaboration. So certainly China is is heavily engaged with the rest of the world at, in in developing a, a vaccine and, and is heavily engaged in doing the research uh, to to mitigate the effects of the, of the pandemic. And so I think that, yes, it does enter in. And again, if you look at, at how the rest of the world is viewing this, I think that they see China as being a, a, a serious actor, as being, as being a, an actor that is actually interested, again, in finding a collaborative approach. And, and this is all part of uh, you know, the, the Chinese narrative that win-win cooperation and all this stuff that they always talk about, I think the rest of the world sees. The United States, of course, says, oh, that's just, that's just the Chinese trying to trick people. But I think that the rest of the world doesn't quite see it that way. If you look at, if you look at the news coming again from, from the rest of Asia, from Europe, 
you know, they see China as, as someone who has taken an interest in these international organization, in these international collaborative efforts, specifically right now on, on the pandemic. And, and, and so, yeah, they might, they might cheat a little bit on, on how they approach their, their uh, uh, research and how they, how they do their trials. But they also understand that there, there is a international norm for scientific discovery and they're following that they're not they're not just arbitrarily saying we're going to we're going to pr provide a vaccine to everybody they're they're actually i think collaborating better and they're working through the who they're not walking away from the who so they're they're collaborating with with individual companies they're collaborating with the who and so i think that that in the end they're looking like a a better actor in this sense than the united states oh i i totally agree um, well, so, you know, up to this point, Carl, we've had so many Chinese researchers and academicians all through our colleges and universities, all through our research companies and facilities in this country. Um, they have made great contributions, not only to, uh, you know, the global effort in medicine in general and, and all kinds of science, um, but also to the, you know, the United States initiatives. And uh, so, I mean, I really wonder how this contention is affecting them. Uh, there, you know, it's a certain amount of racism against them that he's whipped up. Um, uh, he's, he's made it hard for them to travel and immigrate and, and lead the lives they were hoping to lead before. Um, and and if you if you you, you you throw them out, you don't let them lead those lives. Um, that is, um, it's, it's another one of his immigration initiatives. And, and the result is we lose all that talent that has been so instrumental. I mean, you and I can see that there's so many people with Chinese names, with Mandarin names sprinkled throughout the country and they're all achievers, it seems like, and they're all from China and now they're at risk. Um, so that has, that, that's going to have, or already has had an effect on the ability of this country to do research and uh, academic discovery. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, we are a country of immigrants and, and Chinese are, those are, part of, are part of that demographic. And and what we're doing is is we're we're trying to turn our back on those people, and I think that that uh, some people feel feel very bad about it. And like you say, there are there are Chinese who are are leading experts in in so many areas in the United States, and and certainly in in the hard sciences. You know, when you when you look at at the the math departments and the and the chemistry departments and the and and the biology departments in in the American universities they're full of Asians and, and specifically Chinese who have come to the United States and contributed to uh, American uh, uh, intellectual uh, advancement in all those areas. And so, yeah, I think, I think we really need to, need to step back and think about what we're doing for the long-term national security interests of the United States, which is to have a dynamic economy that's based on, on research, based on science, based on, on developing new ideas, instead of this, this mindset of, of we're going we're gonna to come back and we're going to mine coal and we're going to build uh, iron, iron products in the Midwest. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just so 19th century and, and we can't do that. We, it's an information age and we need to think about it as an information age. And, and when we do that, then we can think about how, how we really need to approach China and how we need to think about integrating our, our, our American economy into a world economy that benefits everybody, not just, not just the United States in a very narrow, closed sort of economy. And I think that that's, that's the hope that we get in, in next, next year. That, that once we're past once we're past this pandemic and once we're past this, this sort of silly competition between China and the US, you know, maybe, maybe this, this flushing out from, from the virus that we'll come to realize that their time is not on our side anymore, that we really need to start thinking about collaborating and, and developing our new economy and, and moving beyond this, this mindset that, that the this, this nation state is the only uh, mm -hmm. reasonable political actor in the international system, that we really do need international organizations to, to advance the areas that need to, be, need to be advanced in terms of the information age. You know, uh, about a month ago, Carl, um, 
Trump announced that he wanted to resume nuclear testing. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that uh, he actually uh, did anything about that. I, I haven't heard more about it, but I've heard reaction to it. Um, and in fact, uh, this week, uh, one of the um, individuals, I think retired general, uh, came on the media and uh, he'd, he'd written a book. He'd written a book about nuclear nuclear testing in the United States. Uh, and and the, the notion of the book was that <clears throat> The president, whether it's Trump, but especially if it's Trump, uh, should not have a one-person discretion uh, to to launch a nuclear attack. Um, and um, we, we don't we don't live in those times anymore. We don't need we don't need that kind of immediate response sort of thing that we thought in the fifties maybe we needed. Um, and this book, I think, would be pretty popular. But what, what troubled me about it is that um, it still seems to be out there in play. Uh, that this president could actually press the button, and that nuclear nuclear has gone beyond deterrence. It's it's gone to first strike thinking, um, and that and and that is the ultimate possibility when you have two nations, both of which have the bomb and which are getting angry at each other at, at some levels, um, and may and may get angrier still. The, how does that play in all of this? Uh, do you think that Congress will ever limit? Uh, should it limit? Can it limit politically? Um, the the notion of having one person uh, controls the, uh, the the football. Well, certainly, I think we I think they should. I mean, this, you know, this was an issue, you know, during the, the the latest nuclear crisis with with North Korea, and and it it came up. You know, really, how much power does how much authority does one individual have? And you're right, it's all based on on the idea that if if the Soviet Union launched a missile, you had to you had to launch yours in 20 seconds, or or you'd be destroyed. You know, well, those days are gone. You know, I mean, it, it's a time to rethink that. But it's a as you say, it's a very difficult issue. So to to give you the short answer, no, I don't think it's possible to deal with that today. But it certainly is something that we need to deal with in the in the immediate future. Mm. And and it's it's it it. It's out of sight, out of mind, because nobody really wants to think about it. You know, the, there's there's a there's a small cadre of people that think about nuclear war, and and it's a it's a probably the most dismal, horrible thing that you could possibly have for an occupation, because because you're really thinking about the destruction of the earth as we know it. But but it needs to be a public conversation about how do we deal with that, and that. It, and, it's a, and it goes beyond just a conversation within the United States. We really need to have a global conversation about this. What are the, what are the impacts of a nuclear weapon? You know, if you think about the panic that, that has been created when we had uh, the, uh, the, the nuclear reactor in Japan, how much, how much panic there was when people were buying salt in Portland because they were worried about, uh, about, about contamination. You know, imagine what would happen if there was actually a nuclear weapon that was detonated, of, of how much panic that would create. You know, so, so again, maybe we've learned something from, from this pandemic, that, that things really don't recognize borders. And so, and so that, that whole arms control approach needs to be rethought. And, and certainly part of that should be, how do we, how do we de-glamorize nuclear weapons? How do we get nuclear weapons out of the mindset that this is the ultimate guarantor of peace? I mean, how perverse that, that we have a, a weapon that, that basically ends, ends the world as we know it as the ultimate weapon of, of peace because that's all we can think of. That's the best we can do. It's, 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 rather, it's rather disheartening when you think about it that way. But, well, you know, when I was a kid, I'm sure you remember too that uh, there were all these um, protests and demonstrations. Uh, let's, let's end nuclear weapons. Remember the peace sign, right? The little peace sign there in, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, and they never got what they wanted. They never really outlawed nuclear weapons and non-proliferation agreements. Really, uh, they're not they're not effective right now. No. Um, Trump has pulled out, and so we're, we're stepping backward on this rather than forward. But but here it takes us to the last question I want to ask you, Carl. <clears throat> and that is, uh, you know, Knockwood. Soon enough, uh, uh, Joe Biden will be president, or at least he'll win the election. Hopefully, that'll stick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going to be 
uh, he's going to have to roll back some of these some of these uh, moves that Trump has made in dealing with China. Um, and it's complex. It's not all right and wrong. It's uh, it's nuanced in, in both sides. Um, what what do you think he'll be able to do that in a reasonable period of time? Uh, what is your advice to him? Because he can he can save it, I think. But how and when and how long and what kind of expertise is he going to need around him to do it? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big question, and it, and it's a big task. And and the the short answer is no. I don't think I don't think he's going to be able to do that in the span of four years because there's a there's a growing consensus in the United States with the among both Democrats and Republicans that we need to deal with China, and I think that's the that's the part that we need to get past, and that's going to take a while because what we really need to think about is how do we deal with the world. And what is what is our place in the world? Trump Trump has has in his in his destruction of so many institutions has really moved us past the point of going back to to the old liberal idea of of uh, you know rising tide rises all boats or or the, the yeah you know I mean so I think we're I think we're past that and we need to really think about what do we really want from global governance what do we really want from from our our global footprint and and how do we deal with these global issues and it, and it can't be the United States' way or the highway which is what the, both Democrats and Republicans have had that we're to the point now where China has become a reasonable player at the global level and we need to recognize that and we need to think about how do we develop a collaborative framework and so that Biden has to has to move in that direction i think that that that's where we need to go we need to roll back some of the excesses of the trump administration but then i think we need to think about where do we go from there and where we go from there is is a more, much more collaborative approach at the global level where we we actually have friends and allies that work with us to to sort of tamp down some of the excesses that we see from Xi Jinping and and other other people of his ilk uh, in in other governments. You know, from uh, a, a policy wonk like yourself, a foreign policy wonk like yourself, that sounds like the most challenging, interesting, and promising experience that the United States can have to repair a relationship that's been damaged, uh, to repair it in such a way that it benefits all the parties and, and the rest of the world as well. Uh, what a great time that would be, don't you think, from, a, from a, you know, an intellectual foreign policy point of view? Yeah, and I think, I think you would stimulate a lot of the people who have left the government to come back and, and really contribute to that. Because like I said, you know, I mean, if you look at, if you look at Trump's aberration as, as the opportunity to rebuild with, with some of the old chivalrous out of the way, just because that's what Trump did, is he, he kicked everything out of the way, that we really have a much more clean slate than we would have had, had we had more continuity in, in the American approach to, to, to global governance and to, to global engagement. And so I think, I think there's, there's uh, the opportunity, and, but it's going to take a, a lot of perseverance on the part of the Americans, because, because the Americans have to lose the mindset that only the Americans can be the global leaders. There has to be a collaboration that can't be, it can't be, okay, we're back in the saddle, now come follow us. I think those days are gone, and we need to, we need to recognize that, and, and Americans aren't going to take that very easily, both Democrats and Republicans because we still want to be number one. We still have the biggest economy, so we still need to be in charge and we need to decide when we can, when we can put sanctions on people and when we can put tariffs on people. And that, that whole mindset has got to shift. And so that's, I think, the big challenge for, for, for the Biden administration when they come, into, they come into office, assuming they win the election in, in November, that, that that's, that's where they need to start from. That, that yes, we're going to, pull back some of the excesses, but then we need to think about building, but not, not bringing back the old ideas, but building new. Yeah. Well, I hope you and I can uh, regroup from time to time, Carl, and take a look at that and see how it's, it's working and, and, um, uh, and have discussions like this. It's been very valuable. Thank you so much, Carl yeah. Baker. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. 